So um, let's talk about method validation. And it is a protocol guided demonstration of method performance for key attributes of a method. And there's a list of parameters there that I'm going to go into very briefly. <clears throat> so key performance attributes of method validation are specificity, which is you really want to look at the right thing. You may have negative controls such as blanks to show that it's discriminatory. Sensitivity is how low can you go in detecting what you need to find. Linearity or trend is simply the ability to see a relationship between response and concentration. Accuracy is close to a true value. It can be also seen as recovery from spike samples. Precision is variability. Range is a somewhat passive term, but it, it is the span that by which you have acceptable linearity or trend, precision, and accuracy. And there's also on this list, there's analyte stability, which is the stability of your sample in a solution prior to being analyzed. You don't want any artifactual, is that a word? Artifactual um, things going on with your sample prior to it getting analyzed. And robustness. <clears throat> robustness is defined as imparting small but deliberate changes to your parameters to see if your method will continue to perform as you like. A good example is when you have an HPLC method with a critical pair of impurities and when you run your method on your center point conditions, you, you're pretty much okay all the time. And yet the devil's advocate side of things could say, well, what if your, your pitch of your gradient is a little bit off? What would happen then? So that's just, a, that's just a single example of what you could be looking at. Okay, I decided to just bring up confusing terms because it so relates to our industry. And, and I don't know if anybody shares this, but you know, you could say, well, whatever. When qualification, verification, validation, and transfer. Um, qualification is often heard when you're thinking about instrument preparation, like design, operational, instrument qualifications, and so on. To a lot of our customers, when they say they want their method qualified, they may either be thinking they want it validated for phase one, because in their culture, that's what they call it. And trust me, on protocols, they want me to replace the word validation with qualification. To most of the rest of us, though, and I think it's a little West Coast, East Coast thing, but I believe that qualification in method development terms is a research-based, not protocol-driven attempt to show suitability for intended use. You could think of it as a mini-validation, um, but it's, it's typically not something formal. Uh, if that changes over time, well, it, then it will change over time. Verification is a term that should be really uniquely applied to compendial methods. Method, methods such as Carl Fisher water content, where a lot of validation had gone into those methods that get published in the compendia, so that you just need to show suitability for your molecule with that particular test. And so verification is a protocol driven almost like a mini validation. I'll get into a little more of that in a future slide. Validation is, the th is comprised of what I was just talking about and transfer is another term that I'm gonna show in its own slide. But it can be a protocol driven exercise and it has some overlap with validation. So, this is not meant to be a vision test. What it really was just to help people know that there are guidelines out there that tell you what attributes you need to validate for. As a couple of examples, in this, in this table, specificity really only is required when you're doing a validation of an ID test. And it kind of makes sense because you just want to know what you're looking for. On, in contrast, with impurity assays, you want to make sure you include sensitivity as part of the attributes you're looking at. For assay tests, you may not need to get sensitivity involved since you're only really looking at a parent component. <coughs> I think people may know that the ICH stood for International Conference on Harmonization and they of course are blending together the primary inputs of US, Europe, and Japan. Now Regis has something that is not an SOP, 
in this, for this table, but I'm just sharing with you a general practice of what we share with our customers. <coughs> it's not binding. It reflects what we think is generally a composite of the industry. And we try to advise our customers, yes, you should validate at phase two. Um, or if they refuse to validate at phase three, we tell them, you pretty much have to. But, you know, go talk to somebody in regulatory. And it always gets interesting when we're having these discussions. In our business, things start with discussions. They go to quotes and proposals. And then there's a judgment of those proposals. And where the money's involved, there's always a questioning. And you do need to just pay attention to the practices of the industry. And there are people in our, in our audience today that have a lot more experience than me in knowing across the world what, what is exactly required. But I'm just going to briefly go through this table and use my laser pointer to highlight a few things. So final product assays, generally, and you can follow along with your own notes too, you really need to validate the method by the time you're in the phase three and commercial mode. You should validate, but it's not required in the regulatory literature for phase two. And in phase one in preclinical, there is much less industry practice that's always saying you're going to validate, though some c careful and conservative companies do. When you're looking at precursors, which again by definition is intermediates and starting materials, you really only have to be validating methods. This doesn't work anymore. Uh, you really only need to be validating methods for precursors in, in the final stage or in phase three and commercial. And when it comes to compendial, gen, compendial general quantitative assays, such as water content, verification would be required only at the late stage. Now, once again, customers vary greatly. This is, this is not a narrow Gaussian distribution, okay? We see a lot, we do a lot of discussion, and this table is just something that gives us a baseline mindset from which to launch those discussions. A few more comments on validation is that organizations really do need to define their practices. Uh, at Regis, we have a guideline. We understand that our customers have a lot of opinions and input, but we do, again, have a baseline from which to work. And if nothing else, if we're being asked to advise on validation, we know what to do. And so we have our default game plan. The ICH is intended for commercial material, uh, but their guidelines are, are pretty much looked at by everyone at all stages just as good advice, if nothing else. Consider also other pharmacopoeia as well. There's Europe and Japan. And although I say it fast, the significance of what they have cannot just be overlooked. So let's talk about method transfers briefly. They can be considered formal or informal. Now, as I see it, informal means somebody sends you an email or they mail it to you and you get that method information that comes from a customer document and they say to you, can you please look at it in your lab, run it, and make sure it's suitable for intended purpose. But a formal transfer is something that's protocol driven. Companies should have SOPs around how they handle method transfers. And the, again, there is, well, there is a sending lab and there's a receiving lab. And, and Regis Technologies has actually had both roles. We have actually been a sending lab as well for third parties. But in either case, there needs to be some set of rules that you follow as to how you conduct these. Um, since we're on the receiving end more for these transfers, we see that either a complete validation, almost like a carbon copy validation, would be asked of us at our facility or maybe a subset. Maybe we don't have to do linearity evaluation, but they want us to check the method can pass injector precision in a sequence. And also, we may, we may be asked to do a comparative assay of a given sample. So to make sure that if they got 99.7%, we got 99.7% plus or minus 0.2. So it could be any of those things. There's a lot of flexibility. You can't put it all into one sentence. This is how a transfer is done. I had mentioned method verification, and that's for compendial methods. It's like a mini validation. Uh, the compendial guidelines, at least the USP, 
things. Do leave it to your judgment as to what is appropriate. And you gotta be fair in what you're doing. You may not have to, uh, for example, with Carl Fisher, run linearity for an assay that's been validated by you know, all the, I really don't know where it came from, but whoever put that into the compendia in the first place, there is a known trend response based on the electrodes used in Carl Fisher so that you don't have to repeat that part. But what is important is to show that you can recover your sample um, from your sample, let me say that over, you need to recover from your sample the water that you might spike in as an as a accuracy experiment. And you also want to check precision. So you want to make sure that for your compound based on your process at your facility, can you perform this assay. And it should be protocol driven, especially at late stage. There are a few compendial tests that you really don't have to do that for, and they're listed here. Uh, residue ignition is, is something that is basically a burning test, so you're trying to destroy the material. If you're doing it properly, um, it shouldn't matter what you're burning. Well, there are limitations. I won't, I won't be too absolute, but the USP does mention that if appropriate, you could omit these from uh, method verifications.